is ECME, the electronic circuit making equipment. It is an automatic manufacturing plant which has the distinction of being the first robot to reproduce its kind. That is to say, it employs advanced electronic control technique in order to manufacture complete electronic circuits of the type used in radio sets, television, radar and similar devices. In a typical radio circuit, the construction takes the form of a flat plate of insulating material on which the circuit elements such as condensers, inductances and linking conductors are formed in electrical continuity by metal deposit. The plate itself being both the coil former and the condenser dielectric. We start with a plastic moulding in which the circuit elements are represented by grooves and depressions. Those for the fixed condensers are circular and translucent, being aligned on both sides so as to leave only a film of insulation of predetermined thickness. The magnetic coupling between the two coils is obtained by forming the coils on opposite sides of the plate as shown in this cross section. The coil turns are V-shaped in section and of substantial thickness. The condenser electrodes and the separating dielectric are seen to be a watch glass for The surface of the moulding is first roughened by a grit blast machine. A substantial deposit of metal is then applied by successive metallizing processes. Surplus metal is removed by a series of face milling operations which impart a smooth finish and leave the required circuit, components as well as wiring, in a finished form. These three basic processes, grit blasting, metallizing and machining, govern the layout of the manufacturing plant. This takes the form of a conveyor moving horizontally through a series of cubicles of uniform dimensions, each group of cubicles having a distinct function. This form of unit construction enables the plant to be rearranged for manufacturing different types of circuit. And now to the machine itself. The feed magazine is empty, as indicated by the appearance of the red warning light, and the operator inserts a supply of mouldings into the magazine rails. From the magazine, they are propelled one by one onto the conveyor. From this point, all operations take place without human assistance. Loading is checked by a photoelectric cell, and the yellow light indicates the presence of plates in the magazine. The correct entry of the first plate into the first cubicle is indicated by a green light and the operator can then leave the machine unattended until the magazine is again exhausted. The first cubicle is an airlock fitted with self-closing rubber flaps which allow the plate to pass through and into the second cubicle containing the grit blast machine. This is totally enclosed and lined with rubber as a protection against the destructive effects of the abrasive but the cine camera enables us to see the operation in progress. Abrasive grit is forced by compressed air through the moving nozzles, arranged on either side of the plate in such a manner that no part of the plate surface escapes attention. The shiny finish of the moulding gradually disappears under the grit blast, and the walls of grooves and depressions are roughened very thoroughly to ensure the firm adhesion of the metal which is applied later. The machine does not start to function until a plate has actually entered the cubicle and it closes down during any period when no plates are present, thus avoiding unnecessary wear on the equipment and waste of power. The plate, now completely roughened, emerges from the rubber conveyor through another airlock onto the chain conveyor which will carry it through successive stages of metal spraying. These metallizing machines are of particular interest and represent an advance on standard practice in metal spraying technique. Metal in wire form is fed into flame jets and as it melts is atomized and sprayed onto the plate by compressed air. As the plate moves into position, the eight metallizing jets burst into activity. These are arranged four on each side of the plate to allow simultaneous treatment of both faces and the oscillating motion ensures very even coverage.
The panel then leaves the chain conveyor of this group. and enters the first of a group of special face milling machines, arranged as alternate twins, each side taking a predetermined depth of cut off the metal deposit on the high spots, but obviously leaving that in the grooves and depressions. Here again, it is the approaching panel which sets the machine in operation. In this case, starting up the high-speed diamond-tipped milling head, which are mounted on independent micrometer slides capable of individual adjustment to the finest limits. The panel is unclamped, being fed past the rotating tools by rubber rollers, which hold it flat against the faceplate. Smooth transit is ensured by guide rails. The panel passes through other machines of the same type, each taking further cuts until the required depth is reached and the circuit is completely revealed. The surface is then automatically polished and varnished and undergoes an automatic circuit test. It finally emerges onto a flat conveyor ready for stacking. Throughout the whole system, the operation of each unit is dependent on the presence of work to be done, and maximum economy is assured. Further, none of these automatic operations involves any interruption in the steady progress of the plate along the conveyor, which makes for reliable and continuous operation of the plant over long periods. Now let us go back and examine the electronic brains which control these manufacturing processes. They are situated on the other side of the machine. For example, here is the electronic control unit of the metallizing machine. For reasons of economy, the machine will be idle until a plate enters the cubicle. The spray jets are then ignited. This operation takes place in a flash, but it really consists of a series of accurately timed separate operations, each controlled by one of the relays in the group at the top of the panel. These relays are actuated by impulses from this rotary master switch. Ethane, propane, oxygen and compressed air are admitted at critical instants in relation to the ignition spark. Rate of wire feed is governed and the reciprocating mechanism set in motion. In the absence of plates, wire or in case of failure in either machine or control unit, Another timing cycle governs the closing down sequence, leaving the machine quiescent in a safe condition. This happens also if the electricity or any gas supply should fail. The control unit for the face milling machine is of a different type. Its function is to switch on the cutting heads before the approaching plate can reach them and switch off as soon as no plates remain. This not only saves wear on the machine itself, but also ensures maximum tool life by eliminating the possibility of feeding work past a dead cutting tool. Photoelectric cells at the start and finish of the operation actuate a series of relays near the top of the panel. These control the motors driving the cutting tools and rubber rollers by means of the power switches on the inside of the panel near the bottom. From this side, we see the machined panels leaving the face milling group. They are virtually complete circuits and only require the sockets necessary for external aerial connections. The inspection, counting and insertion of these sockets is carried out automatically in this machine. Sockets are loaded in bulk into a rotating hopper which selects them singly from the mass and delivers them the correct way round for inspection. One by one they leave the hopper assisted by the compressed air jet visible in the middle of the picture. Each is halted in turn in the brightly lit inspection window, behind which is a photo cell which controls a swinging gate further down the duct to the right. Bad or incorrectly positioned sockets leave the gate stationary, allowing them to fall into the reject bin, while the perfect ones cause the gate to lift, allowing them to pass to the machine where they queue up 
before being inserted by the machine. An electronic brain ensures that it inserts no more and no less than are required in each panel. This panel requires only three sockets. But the complementary panel, which we see here for the first time, contains 27, including those for the valves. Now in its completed form, the plate is ready for test, again by electronic means. These front panels provide means for selecting the test conditions and sequence, the test voltage levels being maintained by chains of lamps and resistance potentiometers. A rotary switch carries out 50 point-to-point -point comparison tests against a standard panel. Having passed all these tests within the permitted tolerance, the plates pass through automatic varnishing and drying cubicles to emerge here. The plates falling onto the stacking conveyor are therefore a complete circuit, which has been made and tested to conform to set standards of accuracy. If more than one plate should be defective in succession, an electronic memory unit automatically stops production. Thus, the robot inspector does not only detect and throw away scrap, but also stops the further production of scrap. Every time a plate drops, a complete circuit has been manufactured, comprising 15 fixed condensers, stators of two variable condensers, two coils, six terminations, and the equivalent of 50 soldered joints. This is an impressive achievement, even in the case of the simpler type of panel we have been considering. The complementary panel of our circuit is, however, more complex, containing as it does valve holders and condenser sockets, loudspeaker and 16 resistors. This panel is fabricated on precisely the same type of conveyor, having additional cubicles containing a graphite spraying machine, which is similar to the metallizing machine. The test engineer indicates its position. The mains dropping resistances, an anode feed resistor, are typical components formed by this machine. On the reverse side of the second panel will be seen the sprayed on tracks of the dual potentiometer. This performs the functions of combined volume and tone control. Loudspeaker, electrolytics and valves are fitted by hand and this panel is then ready to meet the high frequency circuit from the number one conveyor. After a warming up period, aerial and reaction condensers are adjusted and locked. The molded cabinets arrive at this stage and the completed chassis is inserted. In ECME, we have an answer to the vexed problem of labor shortages by increasing production with a minimum expenditure of man hours. The products of ECME will bring radio within the reach of millions throughout the world who have been denied until now the educational and entertainment benefits afforded by broadcasting. It is only by adopting such technical advances.